Today, I am pleased to welcome as our speaker, Joe B. Paoletti, Associate Professor of American Studies. Professor Paoletti studied clothing design as an undergraduate and received a PhD in textiles from the University of Maryland in 1980. She has taught at the University of Maryland since, and I have a blank here because I meant to ask you before. You, 1976. 1976, all right, she's taught here since 1976. Offering courses on the history, theories, and methods of American studies, material culture, and fashion and consumer culture. Her research, research interests include teaching and learning, um, and she's published on the subjects of service learning, undergraduate research, and the use of new technologies in humanities teaching and learning, uh, and she is a founding member of the International Society for the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning. Her other major research area, or at least one of her other major research areas, uh, is the history of children's clothing in America, an interest that resulted in the book she is going to talk about today. Pink and Blue, Telling the Boys from the Girls in America, was published last year by Indiana University Press. Professor Paoletti notes that her study began with a simple but intriguing question. When did we start dressing girls in pink and boys in blue? I notice I'm wearing a blue shirt here today. Uh, to try to answer that question, she has looked at uh, advertisements, catalogs, dolls, baby books, blogs, and discussion forums, and a variety of other popular media to examine the surprising shifts in attitudes toward color as a mark of gender in American uh, children's culture, clothing. Please join me in welcoming Professor Taylor. Thank you, Eric. What I'm going to do is kind of walk you through the book a bit and explain some of the histories that are in it, because I like to describe it not so much as a history of gendering children's clothing, <coughs> but as the histories of, because as you'll see, there are lots of different stories, there are different strands in this story that made it confusing at first and probably partially explains at least why it took me 30 years to get around to writing the book. <laughs> and hopefully the book is less confusing than the original process was. Uh, first of all, there, there isn't a whole lot of literature out there on the history of children's clothing, period, much less children's clothing in America, and there was nothing at all on the gendering of children's clothing. So that there had to be a whole lot of just descriptive research that was done at the beginning. Uh, I've got to say that if you like looking at pictures of clothing and looking at children's clothing, that can be fun, but after a while it gets a little bit tedious. You're looking at lots and lots of images and trying to figure out what am not only what am I seeing, but what did someone see when they looked at this 100 years ago? The primary sources I used uh, were one of the challenge that I had was because uh, the typical primary source for a, a fashion historian is actual garments. And most costume collections in museums and historical societies have lots and lots of women's clothing, not so much men's clothing, a tiny bit of children's clothing, most of it girls, most of it's party dresses. So the, the actual clothing that children wore is, not, is an interesting source to look at sometimes, but not a useful source for what was actually being worn. <laughs> so instead I had to look for things that would tell me something about gender and give me some insight into real children. And we're to, since I'm dealing with children who lived over 100 years ago, doing, for example, oral histories, you know, is, is, is dicey at best and requires a medium. So the two primary sources that ended up being the most useful were paper dolls and baby books. Now, paper dolls, they're not as popular today as they used to be, but for a long time they were really, really popular toy for, for children, and they're still a popular collectible for adults. And there are several really great collections of paper dolls on the East Coast. I was fortunate to be able to get to the Winter Tour Library in Delaware and the Strong Museum of Play in Rochester, which is well worth a trip to Rochester if you can think of an entire giant museum all devoted to toys and play. And the Indianapolis Children's Museum is also a great source. What I liked about these and what drew me to them is the fact that one of the really common ways of having paper dolls arranged was to have a brother-sister set. So you had twins that were brother and sister. What better way to look at what the girl and boy version of a particular style was because they would put them in brother-sister outfits. Uh, the ones you see here, just for example, these are, are from the late 1920s and it's the um, Peter and Polly 
twins. So one's a girl, one's a boy. So in looking at that, besides the girl having the rosier cheeks and the more coquettish pose, uh, there's not a whole lot other than that. They both have short blonde curly hair and they're both wearing sunsuits. The girl's in blue, the boy's in yellow. And the whole book had this sort of outfit where you had the boy and girl version. So this was one of the primary sources I relied on. The other one I fell, just fell over. I happened to meet somebody at a, a professional meeting who said, oh, did you know that the UCLA Biomedical Library, a place I often hang out at as a historian of fashion is biomedical libraries, has just acquired a collection of 1,300 baby books. And I said, wow, that would be really great because a baby book is like the scrapbook of a baby's life. Um, you more often done for the firstborn than the secondborn, but still, it's the sort of thing that obsessive mothers in the late 19th and 20th century have created with snippets of hair and baby announcements and baby cards. And I knew, just having looked at a few myself, very often lists of gifts because this was where you would record every present the newborn got or that you got at a baby shower so you could write the thank you notes later. And they would be descriptive enough so you'd remember that you know, Aunt Martha gave you the pink dress so that you'd say thank you very much for the nice pink dress. So there'd be a descriptive list as well. Well, these turned out to be a real gold mine. I went there uh, on a traveling fellowship and spent a week there looking at about 800 of the 1300 baby books because that's how many actually had things written in them and, and enough material in them. And they were all sorts of things. The first book I opened up had two little scraps of chambray, which is the kind of fabric probably that Eric's blue shirt is made out of. Um, but it's a, a, a light fabric, usually pastel, because it's white threads in one direction and colored threads in the next. One swatch was pink, one swatch was blue, and it said, my first rompers. And since I ho have a whole chapter on pink and blue and a whole chapter on rompers, it was like, I can go home now. Mm -hmm. This is great. But they also had things like, this is a, a baby announcement from 1915 for a little girl. Uh, and as is typical of most of the baby announcements before, say, the 1930s, it's baby blue. You think of pink and blue as being gendered, and yet there was a time when baby blue was associated just with baby things. And if you went to a stationer for baby announcements, chances are that's the color you'd buy. But I also had to, once I had all this description and had some sense of how children's clothing had changed and what the coding had been for telling a boy from a girl 100 years ago, 125 years ago, 80 years ago, 50 years ago, 30 years ago, then I had to somehow explain these very, very complex changes that I was seeing. So the secondary sources that I was using had to come from a lot of different disciplines. Uh, including material culture studies, which is the study of objects that's very often used in American studies and art history, history and culture of childhood, and that was more history and social history, children and consumerism, and there's a, a, a growing body of work in, on children and consumerism and sociology, and children and gender identity, which got me into the area of uh, human development and child psychology. If there's an underlying argument or theme in the book. It's what emerged in my research was that there is a pattern in the way that fashion changes that's especially visible with children's clothing that other costume historians, fashion historians really haven't noticed. There's this tendency among my colleagues to talk about the, the fashionable woman as if she's just this timeless, ageless person who is always about 22 years old and very fashionable and that she doesn't have a past, um, she's just dressing according to whatever the moment is. And it's, it's kind of a flaw in the, the historiography of, of fashion, but it's been that way for quite a while now, and I keep trying to, to rail against it. And this book is helping me rail. <laughs> and I'm, I'm thankful for that. But what I was seeing instead is if you look at children's clothing, you start understanding that because I was looking at babies and toddlers, and they do not pick out their own clothing, they do not dress themselves. It's their parents, typically their mothers, projecting their own memories, desires, tastes on the child. And 
I was seeing what I call echoes of what they were experiencing in their own childhoods when they became parents. And the more I went looking for this, the more I discovered that there are other instances of this. And what I'm trying to argue now, uh, I'm, I'm working on a book on unisex clothing from the 1960s and 70s, is looking at how some of our current trends, not just fashion, but other trends as well, are influenced by our experiences at various ages in the 60s and 70s, whether you were a six-year-old at the time, a 16-year-old, a 26-year-old, or whatever. So looking at a more kind of generational approach to studying cultural change. Now, I'm going to be talking about several of the chapters in the book because each one of them is a separate history. The main idea in the dresses for girls and boys chapter is looking at the history of what used to be the standard uh, ungendered unisex, whatever you want to call it, outfit for a baby and throughout the 19th century, and actually toddlers as well, right up to the age of about four or five, which was a white dress. Now, many people, when they see those white dresses, they think that it's a, a christening dress, but it's, it's actually everybody wore white dresses. For christening, you might wear an extra fancy one, but you didn't have a special dress that was white, and that was the only white dress you owned. One of the things that really struck me about this tradition of dressing babies and toddlers it, all alike in white dresses was that it did not bother people at the end of the 19th and early 20th century at all that you couldn't tell the boys from the girls. Whereas today, those of you who have younger brothers and sisters or, chil or, or children of your own or nieces and nephews, you know that people care very much if you can tell the boys from the girls. It, it, it is your obligation when you go out with your child that every stranger should be able to tell at a glance what, you, what sex your child is. Whereas in 1905, the Mellon's Baby Food Company could actually have uh, a contest featuring 20 pictures of babies and you had to pick, decide, tell which one was the boy and which was the girl. And they were going to, this was done at the, uh, the St. Louis World's Fair. And so there were like hundreds of people who took this quiz. And they were going to give $250 in gold to the person who could correctly guess the boys and the girls. No one got all 20 correct. The person who got the $250 uh, got 18 out of 20. By the way, I replicated this last year, Maryland Day, and the best we could do, I think, I, we, we started off with offering them some kind of prize if they got 18 out of 20, because I figured eight hey, people in 1905 could do that. We lowered it throughout the day to the point where finally we were giving out our little prizes to people that got 13 out of 20. Because the stark truth is, if you take babies under about the age of two and put them in all identical clothing with no gender signifiers, you can't tell the boys from the girls. Again, something maybe we find a little bit uncomfortable, uh, people in 1905 thought was pretty funny. So that a lot of the pictures you see have these babies, and young children, in white baby dresses. Sometimes it's a christening gown, as in the, the baby on the left, that is actually a picture of a, a baby in a christening gown, or the picture on the right where you just have a brother and sister in the typical infant dress and the typical toddler dress. Uh, the sister is the older one standing behind the chair, and the brother is the little one sitting on the chair. But probably the, the dress the little brother is wearing could have been worn by the big sister when she was little. There was absolutely no such thing as a boy's dress and a girl's <coughs> dress, just dresses. Now there were dresses for boys because once a boy outgrew his baby dress period where he was wearing white, he was not quite ready for pants yet. So well until the early part of the 20th century, little boys before they started school, they might have had short hair as this boy does, and this is from around 1870, but he was not old enough to wear even short pants, much less long pants, which were what men wore, but they did have dresses for boys. Sometimes they were just plainer versions of what girls wore. Sometimes they were identical to what girls wore because, again, the idea that this could be handed down was an economic factor, but we could, we could hand down clothes now, but we don't because we like to tell the boys from the girls more than they did back then. 
So in looking at, at this history of dresses for boys, I started wondering, like, what is different about parents at that time? How are we different, and how did we get to be that different? Now, the other side of the story, besides the dresses becoming something that was for girls, are pants becoming something that used to be just for boys, but then become not only for boys, but girls as well. Now, I remember I said that little boys went through this transition of white baby dress to a toddler dress, a little child's dress, and before they were old enough to wear pants. And this was something that was pretty common as a theme in the boy paper dolls, because one of the things that you do when you design a, a, a toy is to kind of incorporate scripts into it of how might a child play with this toy. And if you had a boy paper doll who was supposed to be around four or five years old, you'd have that script incorporated into it that he is going to wear dresses and then there's going to be this big event, he's going to have a birthday and he's going to be put in trousers. So this is Polly's brother Percy uh, this is from 1910. This is the sort of thing that would have appeared. This particular one was printed in full color in the Baltimore American, but would have appeared in newspapers along with uh, cartoons, cartoon strips on, in the Sunday papers, so you could cut them out and play with them. So Polly's brother Percy has a kilted outfit that's in the upper right with the, the bugle and the big straw hat. Actually, the big straw hat, I think, might go with the overalls, but it's hard to tell. But he also has an outfit to his lower left that is a tunic over a pair of bloomers that's kind of an intermediate style. And then he also has several outfits that have pants. So when you play with Polly's brother Percy, you can take him through these stages from dress to tunic outfits with bloomers to real pants. At about this same time that you have pants being this really masculine garment that little boys attain when they go off to school or when they're about, again, five or six years old, you have the introduction of rompers. Uh, it's kind of the great-grandparent of today's onesie. It's an all-in-one garment. It was originally designed as something that was like a pinafore with legs, so it was an apron meant to be worn over those white dresses that got very dirty. Uh, I love this, this picture, it was a snapshot, the one on the left is kind of uh, blurry and shiny. It's a, an, a snapshot from 1910 that I found in one of those baby books. It's the other thing I love about those baby books. And it's of a little girl named Hope Jewett, um, who is just learning to walk and she's holding herself up on a chair and she is wearing a romper. Now she's wearing the early type that is buttoned up the back and worn over that white baby dress, which you can practically see through the romper. And you can also see that kind of padded effect that it gives. The romper goes from being this utilitarian apron garment to a play garment for children, both boys and girls, fairly rapidly. The baby on the right is a little boy from the 1920s wearing the, the romper that is now just a garment. It's worn over underwear or a diaper. Uh, rather than this, this voluminous apron sort of thing. Rompers become very popular very, very quickly. There is absolutely no discussion in the parental literature about whether or not this is an appropriate thing for little girls to wear, despite the fact that once upon a time women were not allowed to wear pants, little girls didn't wear pants, only men wore pants, and that that was still a fairly contentious issue in the, the early part of the 20th century. Women and older girls did wear, uh, say, bloomers for gymnasium. They could wear trousered outfits in certain situations, usually only with people they knew really well or other women around, like in a gym class or something like that. By the 1920s and 30s, play clothes for girls were as likely to have pants or shorts as be little dresses, and even the little dresses would have bloomers underneath them. And again, it, it's interesting to me that it happens in this completely uncontroversial way. One of the stories that starts emerging as I looked at this is that it isn't kind of this equal 
gendering, boys become more masculine, girls become more feminine, their clothing. What happens is a lot of the things that used to be just baby clothes become redefined as feminine and are rejected then or, or not used for boys. So I have this chapter that's called A Boy Is Not A Girl because a lot of what you see happening in the early part of the 20th century in terms of the masculinization of little boys is redefining them as being masculine earlier and also that masculinity is basically not femininity, that a, a boy is an ungirl or a non-girl. And this is, this is where it begins. Uh, there's a book published in the 1880s uh, that becomes a play that goes all over the world and all over the country and becomes this craze called Little Lord Fauntleroy. Now the actual Little Lord Fauntleroy from the book is not a prissy little spoiled kid. He is, if you've ever read the book, it's written by the same author, Frances Hodgson Burnett, who wrote uh, The Secret Garden and The Little Princess. She's a very popular children's author at the time. And Little Lord Fauntleroy was typical of her characters in that he's this little pure-hearted boy who redeems the adults in his life because he is, in many ways, such a little gentleman. But he's not prissy and he's not a sissy. However, he was wearing what was fashionable at the time the book was written. In fact, the, the illustrations for the book and the costumes of the play were all based on uh, what Francis Hodgson Burnett's sons wore, which had already been in fashion at the time without, again, without controversy or, or remark, that was a, what was called a, a cavalier suit. Little boys' outfits, once they went into trousers and they weren't wearing dresses anymore, they still weren't allowed to be little men because the idea was that you became more masculine as you got older. And the older you got, the more masculine your clothing was. So that putting a six or seven year old boy in an outfit that made him look like Romeo or a little Scotsman or a 17th century cavalier like the Three Musketeers was part of fashion at the time. So the Little Lord Fauntleroy suit, which derives from this cavalier outfit, uh, it just, you can buy them in, in Sears catalogs, in Montgomery Ward's catalogs, you can rent them and have your kid's picture taken in them just for the moment. Uh, and so there probably wasn't a middle class boy in America that at some point wasn't tormented either by the reality or the promise, the threat of a Little Lord Fauntleroy suit. And of course then they'd take his picture and it would stay there forever on the mantle. So these are all different versions of this Little Lord Fauntleroy suit. Very often, not just the, the uh, little cavalier suit with the lace collar and the lace trim, but also because it was believed in the 19th century that cutting a child's hair would make it coarse. They would let their hair grow really, really long and, and curl it into these love locks. Again, if you think about what the Three Musketeers looked like, the 17th century heroes, that's the effect they're going for. So this is Little Lord Fauntleroy, and this is pretty much the late 1880s through the middle part of the 1890s with a little bit, starts to taper off then. And then Little Lord Fauntleroy becomes a pariah around 1905. All of a sudden, everything that's written about Little Lord Fauntleroy is that he's this dreadful little spoiled brat of a priggish little boy and that he's not a real boy and real boys would beat him up and all this sort of thing. And you have this, these styles instead for little boys from about 1905 on. And one of the things that's at work here is, according, again, according to the, the magazines where they're writing about this is mothers will like, they'll say things like mothers will like the picturesque look of the Little Lord Fauntleroy suit but father will prefer a sailor suit or a Russian tunic, which is what the middle thing is, or one of the other many fashionable styles that emerge that are more tailored, less Little Lord Fauntleroy and a little bit more masculine, although not quite as masculine as the 1950s where they're wearing little suits and little neckties and everything else. But there's a really strong influence of the fathers in 1905, and I'm sitting there saying, who are these fathers and where do they come from? Well, these are the little boys from the 1880s. Then I had to get 
to the, the issue of pink and blue. And sometimes I regret that I titled the book Pink <coughs> and Blue because uh, I'm finding that when I do media interviews, that's all they want to talk about. And as I've just explained to you, the first part of the book doesn't mention pink and blue at all. And in fact, Indiana University Press being an academic press, I couldn't even have color pictures. So there are no pictures in the chapter for pink and blue. But Pink is for Boys is basically about how we arrived at pink and blue the way we see it today. And it starts off with pink just being a color. That pink was a pastel color. Pastel colors were associated with the young. Uh, a, a married woman past the first couple of years of marriage or the first child would probably not wear pink. Uh, they wore darker colors, pink, uh, light yellow, light green, light blue. These were all used for babies and children and young women, but not for mature adults. So that if you look at the baby paper dolls from the first, the, the late 19th and the first part of the 20th century, they're wearing all kinds of colors, including pink and including blue, and they're not used in a gendered way. <coughs> this is, and as a matter of fact, a lot of times they're just presented as this is, again, Polly had a big family. This is Polly's paper playmates, the baby. So they're not even presented as baby brother Bob or baby sister Betty. It's just the baby. And that's clearly the way people thought of them as the baby. They did not have gender, even though they may have known what their biological sex was. Certainly the family knew. But the idea that you would dress a child in a gendered way was you know how some of us feel about toddlers and tiaras as being, oh, this is kind of inappropriate and some of these outfits are a little bit too old for the girls. That's the way they would feel about the way we dress babies. They would say, oh, you shouldn't draw attention to their sex because children shouldn't notice this. If you dress them alike, then they won't notice sex, they won't think about it, they won't think about it until later on when it's okay for them to think about it and we're ready to explain it to them. But you certainly don't dress little children in a way that draws their attention to this. So the idea that you would color code babies in a really obvious way does not enter into the design of children's clothing in the early 20th century. When it does, it's very confused. So we have, um, very, very early on in Little Women, you have Amy putting a pink ribbon on the girl twin and a blue ribbon on the boy twin in the French style, so you can always tell. Now, the fact, uh, not the French style, the French fashion, the fact that they use the word fashion tells me that it's something that might have been something in fashion when she was in Paris or she's read about it, that this is what they're doing this season, but it's expected to change. You start having people coming into the United States in large numbers from all over Europe. And many of these countries did have gendering patterns. Uh, in Catholic Germany, it was pink for boys and blue for girls because blue was the color of the Virgin Mary. In Belgium, it was the same way. Uh, in France, it depended on the fashion. In England, they were both baby colors and they weren't used in a gendered way. So when the infants clothing manufacturers started thinking, wow, we could use this as a way to market children's clothing and people might actually have to buy more than one, one outfit if they had more than one child and not pass them down so much. And this, this was actually when I went looking for just the answer, you know, you have a research question that's a big one and you have this little question of, I'm just gonna look this up because somebody must know this. That question for me was, when did they start, when did we start using pink and blue? Because I figured someone had already done this research and I could just look it up. This is long before Wikipedia, Wikipedia, but I still figured it was out there somewhere and I would just find it. Well, instead what I found, I found an article in, in a business index that said pink or blue from the children's department, which is like the women's wear daily of the infant's wear industry from 1918. I thought, bingo, here it is, here's the article. I got to the article that said, We've gotten a lot of inquiries lately about pink and blue and which is for girls and which is for boys because there's a lot of confusion and they kind of blame the greeting card people for confusing people. And then they said, so we want to just make it clear, we'll lay down the law right now, it's pink for boys, blue for girls. 
And at that point, sitting there in the Library of Congress reading room, my head exploded and I said, this is gonna take longer than I thought. <laughs> so, this is a chart that I worked up from Time Magazine from 1927. Remember I mentioned that in Belgium it was pink for boys? Well, the, the Queen of Belgium was expecting a baby and they <coughs> decorated the nursery in pink in hopes of an heir. And the people at Time said, what, what? because apparently people at the time believed it was pink for girls. And they actually did the legwork and called up major department stores in all the big cities in the U.S. and said, so which is it, pink for girls or pink for boys? And this is the result. So I've color-coded it to make it really, really easy. Uh, in Boston, if you shopped at Filene's and you went to the infant's department, all their boy stuff would be pink. And they would say, ah, the, you're your friend had a, a boy, well, here's this lovely pink receiving blanket for him. If you were in Philadelphia, John Wanamaker's, no, they believed it was blue for boys. Uh, Cleveland, Chicago, New Orleans, San Francisco, pink for boys. Manhattan, very confused. Some of each, depending on where you shop. So this was 1927. And I kept finding more and more of this sort of evidence that it really wasn't a rule that everybody had to follow all across the country until, well, there'd be little pockets of the Pink for Boys crew as late as the late 1970s, early 1980s, because there were some predominantly German Catholic places in, say, eastern Nebraska where they still felt that blue was the girl color. I don't know why this is all of a sudden decided it's not going to. There we go. And I kept finding examples of boys wearing pink. Pink was a really common color for little boys' spring suits, like if what you dress the boy up for Easter, you go out and get a pink linen suit. 1953, you know, anybody know who this is, who the character is? It's, it's the littlest boy, it's, it's Michael from Peter Pan, it's the little brother. And I hadn't even remembered that he wore pink pajamas all the way through the whole movie. Until somebody reminded me and then I went and looked and sure enough, there he is, 1953. He was wearing pink and nobody went and ran off and complained to Fox News that he was wearing pink. However, this is the re-release of Peter Pan, it's just out this year. And if you notice, there's Michael at the very end and they've recolored him. So he's wearing blue now. But Wendy's wearing blue too. Ah, well see, that's why pink and blue are not equivalents. Pink is, uh, somebody came up with this great word, and I wish I had invented it. They said, pink is the spokes, spokes color for femininity. And I said, yes, that's what I've been trying to say all this time. Pink is the spokes color for femininity, but blue is not the spokes color for masculinity, because girls can wear blue as long as they're wearing something that's very feminine. Matter of fact, I would say that pink, it's like rock, paper, scissors, like pink is stronger than skulls, because if you have a pink outfit with skulls, it's for a girl, right? Now, I have a whole chapter in the book on unisex clothing because I kept thinking, well, what happened? There's this kind of weird period in the 60s and 70s, which admittedly is a weird period anyway, but there it is, where all of a sudden they're going back to let's dress children in a neutral way. So here we have two different patterns from the late 60s and early 70s. Uh, the one on the left is actually an outfit for boys. If you look, kind of have to look sideways, above the 4299 that's the number for the pattern, it says boy size two. This is an overall with a little uh, stand-up collar shirt or a turned down collar shirt for a boy's dressy outfit. And then you have the one on the right from 1971, I think, uh, that is identical outfits for boys and girls. And this is, when, I, when my nieces were young, they were born in like, 68 and 70, this is what I knew. And watching Sesame Street at the time with them, it's like boys and girls all dressing alike. So when I had a, a, a child in 82, I continued to do that. When I had the boy in 86, I couldn't do it anymore because the market had changed. 
as all of a sudden in the mid 80s there was a huge shift Pampers and Loves came out with pink and blue disposable diapers. They started making those little headbands for little girls. Uh, pink returns with a vengeance. There's not a whole lot of pink clothing at all for girls of any age in the 1970s. You could still get neutral clothes. This is from, I think it's Bio Bottoms from the early 90s. Um, kind of utility, you just basic jeans and pull on pants and polo shirts that were designed to be worn by either boys or girls into the early 90s. But at the same time, starting with the babies, and this is why I don't think it's the kids making this change, it's the parents. Um, you have things like, this is from a, a baby clothing catalog, gift tip, it's a girl, it's a boy, so you know what to do. Be unashamedly generous with pink and blue. Later she can wear jeans and play hockey. Later he can make play pies if he wants to. For now, they're completely and utterly babies. Relax, resist sophistication, and enjoy the babiest things in the world. So this idea that dressing boys and girls in gendered ways is kind of traditional, uh, harmless, kind of unsophisticated. You know, it's the, the pure way to dress them. Oh, there's so much there. Uh, it's, it's kind of uh, third wave feminism making its first little lappings on the beach. So let's talk about this. Uh, I'm still working on this because now that I'm working on the unisex book, uh, I'm incorporating some of the things with babies and toddlers that's in the pink and blue book, but it's allowing me to look at teenagers' clothing and older children and adults at the same time and think about where our ideas about gendering come from and how traditional they really are and why it seems to be so important that we think of them as traditional and whether pink and blue is with us forever and ever. I say probably not because nothing is. Thank you. I would love to entertain questions so I can stop talking. And well, I wouldn't say it's a question, it's more uh, a comment. Our go son ahead, was born even in better. France in 1972. And when we traveled, we didn't know boy or girls. We had lots of yellow and green. <laughs> yeah. People chose neutral groups. But I remember two clothing gifts that we received from our European friends. One was a little knit outfit that was, my memory says, more like an olivey color. It was really a weird color and a navy outfit. And we would never put our babies into that here in this country at that time when we left. We weren't dressing kids in colors like that. I met my little girl three years later, looked a little weird in them, but she wore them. <laughs> and people would really kind of, well, where did that come from? But in France, they have very different ideas of colors yeah. than in this country. I mean, one of the things that's been fascinating is I get reactions to my work from all over the world is how it's still different in some places, but it has become much more uniform as the, as the, uni the infants wear industry has become more global yeah. um, and clo baby clothing is made everywhere and there's not the regional variation we used to have in the United States that it has spread. My, my son who was born in 86 got two outfits from uh, a student of mine who was from Korea and they both had, they were, were trimmed with pink or had pink in them. And she's since gone back to Korea as teaching there, and I asked her, well, how would it, what's it like in Korea now? She said, oh, it's pink for girls and blue for boys. I, I, never, never, I never would give that to a boy now. So that has changed. But there are, other, there, there, uh, there are huge swaths of Africa, for example, where pink is still considered a very masculine color, as it is in some parts of India. So. Yes, Debbie. Okay, so I'm not uh, a, a master of any of this, and it's very, very interesting uh, talk and, and background, but I'm just thinking in terms of colors. Um, I, and, and so my, my perspective might be the following, mm -hmm. that for girls you know, this height, uh, maybe pink is kind of soft and gentle, and maybe boys, I know you can reject it, but I'm thinking this is what may, many people might be thinking. And boys uh, can have maybe the, the dark blue that's really kind of robust, you follow. But the girls, girls can still have blue, but maybe the blue would be light blue, again, more gentle. 
does 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 it does it make sense that some people might think this? It does make that makes sense. But of course, as someone who studies culture, my response is those are cultural responses that mm -hmm. colors don't have those qualities all by themselves. Uh, when you read the, the explanation given in one article be somewhere in, in the teens for why pink was a boy's color is because it's a pastel version of red. We don't look at pink that way. If you've grown up with pink as a feminine color, you're going to see pink as a feminine color. The thing that strikes me as kind of odd is if you're going to pick two colors to denote something as important of gender, you might not pick pink and blue. I don't know how many, if there are anybody in the room who is colorblind. Mm -hmm. But pink and blue, pastel shades of them, don't look all that different to someone who's colorblind. So as an arbitrary co choice, it's not a particularly good one. <laughs> it kind of dooms, I think it's 5% of the male population to not be able to tell the boys from the girls. Yeah. I know you said that things don't last forever, but your projections on whether pink and blue will always define a boy or girl kind of thing, do you think that'll change soon or will it be a while before it does go away? That I don't know. I, I can tell you that, I mean, before pink, probably the, the, one of the colors that had like the strongest symbolism was black. In the 19th century, if, if I walked into a room wearing all black, people would assume I was in mourning that someone close to me had died. I can walk into a room in all black today and nobody thinks that. And that change happened fairly quickly. It's not a gradual thing. It's one of the interesting things about some of these cultural changes. Like we think of fashion as just kind of having this evolution. Well, even evolution doesn't happen gradually and slowly. Sometimes there are big changes that happen within the span of a generation. So, uh, and you have in the 1970s all of a sudden pink I mean, it's, it's interesting to me what happens is pink suddenly becomes this very powerful feminine sy symbol in the 1970s when it is hardly ever worn. And it's because it's, it's associated so strongly with kind of traditional femininity. So the absence of pink in that is part of what gives us its strength coming back in the 1980s. I don't know. I mean, I see, I, I, my son just posted pictures of he's coaching an ultimate team and they just went down to a tournament. It's a co-ed team. They all wear pink. <laughs> so I think pink is starting to morph into something else, at least for adults. So these changes can happen. I thank, thank heaven historians don't usually get paid to do forecasts. <laughs> but I, I think it can change because it actually came on fairly quickly. Yeah. Yeah. I. My grandmother was born in 1899. She's you know, no longer living, obviously, but um, she became a widow before I was born. And my whole life, I never saw her wear anything but black mm -hmm. or black and white. But never yeah. white. But I, I never saw her wear anything but black yeah. and white. So and again, I mean, if you ask someone at in, in the early part of the 20th century or the 19th century, do you think black will ever not be worn for mourning or won't be associated with death? They say, oh, no, no. And that was actually a much longer tradition than pink and blue is. And yet now we can look at the say, well, Denny, <laughs> wearing a black suit. I had, I, I Me? Yeah. Not quite black. Not quite black. Okay, so, so uh, light mourning instead of deep mourning, right? <laughs> You know, my mom. My mom was a, a kind of a well-known weaver, and she made for 30 years, beginning in the early 40s, she made neckties, 30 or 40 neckties. Never, so far as I can remember, never pink mm. at all in them. There's no pink in her yarn stash. None. Maybe olives and maybe blues, and her color tastes were so different from mine. And I'll add to that. She would buy little dresses. They had the, the girls, our two daughters, dressy dresses came at Christmas and at Easter. And his mother loved shopping. They were the only granddaughters. But her color choices would leave me a bit aghast because I'm a strong reds and you know bright colors. And she would choose, there was a brown dress with little flowers mm -hmm, on it. Mm -hmm. There was another one that was navy with red piping. But her color palette 
was just drastically different from what I had put on those same two girls. Yeah. Interesting enough, for the older girl, they worked. Yes. Well, one of the rules that there used to be, and I think I kind of glossed over this pretty fast, was it, if you looked at the turn of the century, at the, the, uh, both the baby books, because a lot of times the baby books will talk about whether the baby has you know, blonde fuzz or brown fuzz and what color their eyes are and all this, or if you look at the uh, paper dolls, mm -hmm. it's blue for the blue-eyed child and brown for the brown-eyed child. The, those of you out there who've ever read the little house books, that's why Mary always got the blue calico and Laura always had to get the red calico because she had the brown hair and the brown eyes. So this idea of what is becoming was very important at one point. And uh, there was one wonderful uh, paper doll book I found where the paper dolls are talking to each other. They have these little scripts for them. And the little uh, brown-eyed blonde paper doll uh, is, has a pink dress for her and part of the script is some people think that blondes don't look well in pink but I think on a real true blonde that looks wonderful and all this so there's this idea that blondes can't wear pink that blondes should wear blue and a lot of the early, earlier things you'll see the matter of fact that the Strong Museum they had a picture of a pair of baby twins in the white dresses and they have one has a pink sash and pink shoes the other has a blue sash and blue shoes and it's from the 1880s and they said we don't know who the babies are but you know that's probably the girl and that's the boy and I was like <laughs> probably not because look at the babies and <coughs> it's the blue-eyed baby that has the blue sash and the blue shoes and for 1880 it's much more likely that that's why they're wearing blue I can't I still couldn't <coughs> tell them whether they were both boys both girls or one of each and which one was which but they shouldn't use our rules to determine the gender of unknown children from 140 years ago. Sure. Sure. I'm going to let you go now. If you want to ask me other questions, I'd, I'd be happy to answer questions. So, but I, there's a little bit more questions. <laughs>